Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. We gather today in honor of an extraordinary American, UN ambassador, a secretary of state, a refugee whose family fled both the Nazis and the Soviets, a great champion of humanity, a great champion of the Aspen Institute, an extraordinary American, Madeleine K. Albright. After relocating to Colorado, where her eminent father became one of the great professors of political science in our country and for whom the school is named at the University of, De of uh, Denver, Secretary Albright spent her teenage years, those formative times, right on this campus of the Aspen Institute, and then, over the years and decades, gave so much back to us in wisdom and inspiration and in serving for 20 years as a trustee and giving us so many scintillating moments on this stage. I think you can probably see, feel her presence with us right now. Maybe you hear her voice right now, right here with us today. We have the honor of hosting former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, former National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley, who will be in conversation with Yamiche Alcindor, uh, who is at NBC Universal and also a proud graduate of Georgetown University, where I met her as an 18-year-old. So proud of you, Yamiche. And first, and to make the introduction, it's my honor to introduce a great friend of the Aspen Institute and a real leader, Katie Albright. Katie serves as Chief Executive Officer of Safe and Sound, a children's advocacy organization focusing on strengthening families and ending child abuse. She has worked as a San Francisco Deputy City Attorney representing district public schools, the San Francisco Education Fund Policy Director seeking to improve teacher quality and increase student retention, and as the Preschool California Co-Director of Policy and Outreach advocating for statewide universal preschool. She is also the co-founder of a nursery school and community center in Nairobi, Kenya, a social entrepreneurship fellow at Stanford, and a SEND fellow of the Aspen Institute. Clearly, the apple did not fall far from the tree. <laughs> Katie, we're so proud to have you here today. Could you please come up and make the introduction? Apologies. We are going to have a, a short video tribute to Secretary Albright, and then Katie will come up and make the introduction. Thank you. I'm so delighted to see all of you here. It's uh, always wonderful for me to come to Aspen. I'm a Colorado girl. My father started teaching international relations at the University of Denver, and Aspen had really just begun. And so they were using local professors uh, as resource people. So I started coming up here when I was a teenager. The thing that makes me different from most Americans my age is that I actually lived through World War II in England and understood what it looked like when you woke up in the morning and came out and saw destroyed buildings. I have one thread in my life, which is that when the United States is not engaged, terrible things happen. And when it is, then usually it's for the best. I have a very basic belief that this is an exceptional country where, in fact, uh, our values have been a motivating factor. And, in fact, America is a very special place and we have special responsibilities. You're a treasurer of the Aspen Institute. You're an American treasurer. You're now a global treasurer as well. Secretary Albright has taken on this duty to do uh, this NATO for the Secretary General. Most people who know me know that I believe in democracy. I don't believe in imposing it. I do believe in supporting it. But I also know democracy has to deliver. People want to vote and eat. American foreign policy has to be value-based. It has to be moral, but it cannot be moralistic where we go around telling everybody what to do. I think people need to listen. I think that is the hardest part, is that we're always on transmit. The art of diplomacy is putting yourself into the other person's shoes. 
because not everything has to be a zero-sum game. I honestly think if you can't listen, you don't belong in the diplomatic service. It is very important to establish the governance procedures because freedom without a set of institutions is very evanescent. There are a number of relationships that one has to have with countries where you don't agree with their government, but I, I actually think it's a mistake not to talk to countries. Basically, I think it's like a, a helium balloon. You need the idealism of the helium to get the balloon up and the ballast realism to get it moving. I'm really delighted to be a part of this family. And I just flat out have to say the only board I wanted to be on was the Aspen Institute boards. Dan, thank you for your kind words. And to the entire Aspen Institute Board of Trustees and the amazing staff members here, fellows and volunteers, my family and I are incredibly grateful to you for this session in honor of our mother. Secretary Clinton, Stephen Hadley, thank you for being here and for your profound friendship and for all that you do to advance the goals that you and my mother shared. As mom said in that beautiful tribute video, she was a Colorado girl. And as Dan said in his warm introduction, my mom's journey to get here started in Eastern Europe before World War II. My grandfather was a Czechoslovak diplomat and an ardent supporter of democracy. When his country's freedom was extinguished by a communist coup in February of 1948, he was able to find refuge in America for himself and his family. My mom never forgot America's generosity towards her family. It was a cherished gift for which she and so many immigrants and refugees in our country, as well as her sons and daughters, will always be grateful Soon after arriving in the United States, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mom, my aunt, my uncle moved to Denver. As you heard from Dan, my grandfather became a professor at the University of Denver, and it was then, as you heard in the video, that the then recently established Aspen Institute asked him to lecture, and my mom got her first glimpse of this extraordinary community as a teenager. So her love for all things Aspen and all things Aspen Institute runs very deep. During the summers when my grandfather wasn't engaged in the Institute, he would teach my mom to fly fish and later us in the beautiful crystal clear trout filled rivers of these Rocky Mountains. As mom often recounted, despite living in Colorado, he maintained his European roots and always fished in a coat and tie. And we so loved going on weekend hikes with my mom to gather mushrooms, learning from her grandmother, her mother, our grandmother, which ones were edible and which ones weren't. At least we thought so. During the winters, mom's favorite days were spent on the general, gentle runs of West Buttermilk or later picking up her grandchildren, her grandies as she called them, after ski school with a cup of hot chocolate in hand. When mom wasn't skiing, she often found a place to sit at the Explorer's Bookstore or in prayer at the beautiful Episcopal Church just up the street. And my family remembers so well December of 1996 when, despite the amazing snow conditions that year, Mom chose to huddle herself inside to study from these very thick binders for her upcoming Senate confirmation hearing where her nomination to serve as America's first female Secretary of State would be considered and later unanimously approved. Yes, she loved everything Aspen and everything Aspen Institute. Mom knew the Institute to be a convener and a collective doer, her highest praise. She noted that the Institute had a clear focus on bringing people together across every conceivable geographic, social, and intellectual boundary. She came here to listen, to learn, to interrupt, to disrupt, and to partner with others to push our society towards liberty and justice for all. 
She wanted to serve on the Institute's board, as you heard, because of its mission to advance freedom of thought, dialogue, leadership, and action. And she knew from her own childhood and life experience why the Institute's commitment to a free, a just, and an equitable society was so important. I know that if mom were alive today, she would be right here on this Aspen campus during this Ideas Festival to focus on the most complex issues of our time. She would be sharing her wisdom to make sense of where we are and the intentions for the path forward. I certainly need her wisdom now. Perhaps we all do. So in that spirit, let me share some words that she wrote in her final months of her life. I hope that they will inspire you as much as they have me. And now I'm quoting my mom. To me, resilience of spirit is the essential ingredient of a full life. No matter how smart we are, we can allow sorrows and grievances to overwhelm or we can respond positively to setbacks. The choice has rarely been starker than in the past two years. Worldwide, we have undergone a period of trial that has changed us in ways not fully revealed. Clearly, our future leaders will have to be gutsy and resourceful, and so each in our own way will we. To those who despair of that possibility, I have a measure of sympathy, but little patience. There is no shortage of worthwhile work to be done and no surplus of seasons in which to achieve our goals. So, now imagine my mom. So let's buckle up our boots, grab our cane if we need one, and march. <laughs> mom always said that she preferred doers to idlers, whiners, and excuse makers. Thank you so much for recognizing my mom's legacy and honoring her memory today. It is, it is now my distinct honor to introduce two people whom my mom admired very much because they followed always a path to constantly improve the world around them, and forever she called them her friends. Stephen Hadley served as National Security Advisor to President George W. Bush from 2005 to 2009, following four years of service as Deputy National Security Advisor. His distinguished career has spanned both the public and the private sectors, and in recent years, he served as the chair of the board of directors of the United States Institute for Peace. It is through his service at USIP that Mr. Hadley and my mom grew especially close. And as they began collaborating on various initiatives and discovered that they absolutely loved working together. They went on to the co-chair the, the Atlantic Council's Middle East Strategy Task Force traveling to four countries together, and co-authoring numerous reports and op-eds aimed at developing a sustainable bipartisan approach to U.S. engagement in the region. My mom was so proud of their work together because it showed that Democrats and Republicans could engage constructively on some of the toughest foreign policy challenges facing our country. My mother was also so grateful and deeply proud of her friendship with Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. Mom always knew and said that Secretary Clinton played a decisive role in convincing President Clinton to nominate my mother to be Secretary of State. Thank you. <laughs> Mom and Secretary Clinton shared a common alma mater in Wellesley College and both used their time at the State Department to champion democracy and human rights. My mother observed firsthand that Secretary Clinton was a transformational leader and an astoundingly successful ambassador of our country as both First Lady and as Secretary of State. 
Hillary Clinton doesn't just make appearances, mom would say. She makes connections by explaining the goodness of the American people and by reaching out so that the world's people can see that America cares. My mother saw that when she traveled to the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995 with then First Lady Clinton and witnessed her proclaim in one of the most important statements of our time that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. Most special, most special to me, my mom and Secretary Clinton were friends, close friends, who shared about being moms, the trials of raising children, the joys of grandchildren, and they spoke often about the everyday and about the future up until the last weeks of her life. Secretary Clinton, my family and I are truly grateful to you for caring so deeply about our mom and for honoring her legacy through your words and your actions. Thank you, Secretary Clinton, and thank you, Stephen Hadley, for being here today. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage along with Amish Alsendor to moderate. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for being here. You guys all can hear me, right? <laughs> thank you, Secretary Clinton, for making the time to be here. Steve Hadley, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Secretary Albright was, of course, a force of nature, and her presence at Aspen was a huge one. So I am honored and delighted to be speaking about her today. Um, her life was incredible, but it was also harrowing. Um, it's been said and it's been noted so many times that she escaped Czechoslovakia twice, once fleeing the Nazis, then fleeing the communists. I wonder what her life experience um, meant to her and how it influenced her life, Secretary Clinton, and her worldview um, as she was doing the important work that she was doing. Well, I am so deeply both honored and delighted to be here um, on behalf of this occasion to remember, celebrate, and honor uh, Madeline. And uh, thank you uh, for having us uh, to do that. I think as Katie said, her life experiences were at the core of who she was as a person and as a diplomat and public servant. Um, as a child being uh, rescued literally from uh, the then Czechoslovakia and taken to London by her family, and remember she did not know she had Jewish relatives. She only found out as a much later in life adult that she had direct relatives who were not so lucky, who had been rounded up, who had been murdered. So she's taken to London in the middle of the Blitz. So as we saw in the video, she's waking up in the morning um, with her family uh, after maybe spending the night in the subways or some other place of safety while uh, London was being bombed to smithereens by the Nazis. And she saw the resilience of the spirit of the British people at that time. Uh, I think that was something that made a, a deep impression on her. And then after the war, uh, her father and mother took them back uh, to Czechoslovakia, where her father intended to resume uh, his career as a diplomat only to run right smack into the next tragedy of the 20th century, uh, the suppression uh, and oppression of Eastern and Central Europe, the creation of uh, a, uh, frankly, uh, wall, as we used to say in those days, um, between uh, the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. And as her father saw that happening, um, he understood that he had to leave again. And that's when they left. And because of his diplomatic connections, um, he was able to bring his family to the United States. And 
And Madeline talked often, in private as well as public, about being that little girl on that ship going into uh, New York Harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty and feeling like that woman was waving to her. You are welcome here. She never forgot those experiences, and we are the better for it. And I hope in honoring her life, maybe we can recall those values which led her to understand and believe that America was an exceptional, indispensable country and that we should not just cherish that but safeguard it. Um, so I, I think she, as, as much as anybody I've ever known, was formed by those experiences and I think thought about them every day, Katie. Something would remind her of how lucky she was, how blessed she was, and how determined that made her to keep trying to contribute to making the world safe for the little Madelines to come uh, from behind. And as you talk about sort of her life and wanting to make sure that there are other Madelines coming up and that there were also really strong women rights in this country and in, and in the world, we're going to get to some news events, but I want to also ask you, Steve, about the fact that she said, um, there's this saying, say something, see something. And she said, I'm going to add to that. I'm going to say, do something. How did her life, in your, in your mind, in, in your opinion, embody that, that, that phrase that she added on to? Well, she actually told us a lot about how she viewed herself in her own words. There's the great phrase, there are two of them, actually, I would commend to you. One, she was asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And she famously said, I'm an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> and I think she worried a lot about where we are in the world today. The other thing she said, to which I was like, she was asked right before COVID, sum up your life in, and describe yourself in six words. And she said, worried optimist, problem solver, grateful American. And, and I think there are three things really that motivated her. I think she never lost sight of what she owed to this country, and it inspired her to give back in the substantial and extensive way that she did. I think that was really one of the things that motivated her. Secondly, her commitment to democracy, but it was not an, you know, a rose-colored glasses view of democracy. She understood the problems of democracy, and as she said, and Katie quoted, democracies have to deliver, because people want to vote and eat. And I think her own experience made her this champion of democracy. And then the third thing is the doer. She had no patience for the whiner. She was, you know, get things done. And this is part of the democracies have to deliver. And America has to lead. So I think in those six words, she really captured who she was and what was her life's focus. And in thinking about her life's focus, she was, of course, Secretary Albright, a fierce defender of women's rights. So we have to, of course, talk about the tumultuous days that we've all been living through. I've been imagining what she would say in this moment. Um, she obviously traveled around the country, Secretary Clinton, talking about women's rights. And now, of course, the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade for the first time, revoking a right that it had granted. How do you believe women in the United States, but also globally as we, of course, in, as the United States, there are other countries that look to us, how do you think women's lives are going to be impacted by this decision? Well, I, I think Madeline and I actually talked about um, this even before uh, the overturning of the Roe decision. Uh, there has been, and we have seen it building, a real pushback against women's advancement and progress uh, in many places in the world. Uh, the uh, pandemic made it even worse uh, because disproportionately the you know problems and costs of the pandemic fell on women and girls again across the world. So you know Madeline was acutely aware that as the tide shifted toward more authoritarianism, uh, more nationalism, more populism, very often the first uh, targets for leaders who were promoting that kind of demagoguery uh, were women's rights. Uh, leaders who would say, we need more children, therefore women, please 
back into the home. We'll come up with, you know, plans so that you'll have more children. That's, uh, you know, Viktor Orban in, in Hungary. Um, and there were just so many of that. We saw Putin, in addition to, you know, everything else we know about him, you know, being disdainful of women and not just, you know, the, his own citizens, but, you know, trying to embarrass Angela Merkel, uh, a fellow world leader, things that were becoming more and more obvious uh, to Madeline and, and certainly to me as well. And so when we get to this decision, and especially if you read it, and I'm a recovering lawyer who once was a law professor, um, it's the most arrogant misreading of history and law that you could ever find. It is so narrow and baseless. And, you know, it's a, look, it's a results, it's a results-oriented decision. Um, put as many words down on the page as you can get. Basically say that, you know, really it was a big mistake, uh, should never have done it. Throw it back to the states, which is all part of what this court is doing on a range of issues. But I found that it was... Um, not only ignorant, but almost dismissive to the point of contempt for women's lives and women's choices and the difficulties that women of all, you know, backgrounds. And this has nothing to do with your opinion, your personal opinion, your religious belief. That's, that was the whole point of choice. I mean, I, I knew Harry Blackman, a, a Republican, appointed by a Republican president, who labored for weeks over this decision. And, in fact, at the time the decision came down in 1973, most of the court had been appointed by Republicans. You know, it might have been 5-4 or 6-3, but it was close. But, you know, we'd had, uh, you know, Nixon appointees, certainly, um, and even some hangers-on from Eisenhower uh, in those days. So these, these were people who had practiced law. They'd been judges, and most importantly, perhaps, they'd lived a very full set of lives, and they argued about this case. I remember because when I was practicing law, I would go to bar conferences where Harry Blackman, who was considered the Supreme Court justice assigned to the Eighth Circuit, which is where Arkansas was and where I practiced, he would come and he would speak, and he was very candid. And he kept saying, he kept saying, you know, what we're trying to do is to leave this choice to the individual, to her conscience, to her doctor. We're not dictating the choice. And he used to say, who would decide this choice? Would, would the government decide this choice, whether it's local government or federal government? And so, honestly, um, I think Madeline would be as worried as I am, both about the impact of the decision on real women's and families' lives, but also about what it says about how our country is retreating from trying to figure out how we have a big, inclusive, pluralistic democracy. I have a quick follow-up to you, and then I'm going to go to Steve. Um, the director of the Mississippi Clinic that is at the center of the Supreme Court decision told me that she does not believe that abortion rights, federal abortion rights, will be reinstated in our lifetime. Do you believe that abortion rights could be reinstated in our lifetime? And if so, what would it take? Well, you're talking about my lifetime or your lifetime? <laughs> you know, I've, I've got a lot more yesterdays than tomorrow's probably. Um, look, I think it will be very difficult, but here's what I do think will happen. Um, if, if the Republicans gain a majority, particularly if they get uh, a Republican president, they will try to pass a... Uh, federal uh, law banning abortion. So even the states uh, like where I live, New York, that are uh, determined to try to protect uh, women's uh, personal choices and not have the government deciding, they may very well face even you know, further restrictions going forward. Since it's been thrown into the states, I think there will be a lot of legal um, and organizing efforts to try to uh, see what can be done, because here's what I think we're likely to experience. If you, if you look at other countries that have criminalized, prohibited, limited abortion, they're all moving in a different direction, in part because with social media, everybody knows about 
the woman in Ireland who was pregnant, who had a complication with her pregnancy, showed up at the hospital seeking medical aid and was allowed to die because the fetus still had a heartbeat, even though she had sepsis. So once that became known, especially to young people in Ireland, they were like, that makes no sense at all. And so they passed a referendum overturning uh, what had been one of the strictest uh, anti-abortion laws in uh, the world. And then you see that happening in Latin America because they're living the real experience. It's not abstract. Women are dying. They're dying from back alley abortions because changing laws don't end abortions. It just forces, you know, women, particularly poor women, into uh, very dangerous situations. And I've been in hospitals where half the hospital patients are celebrating with joy the delivery of their children, and the other half are struggling for their lives because they're there because of botched abortions, like the hospital I visited in Brazil. So it comes back to who decides. And whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, if you want the government making these decisions, if you want a state telling women, we're going to watch you, we're going to track you. We're not going to let you leave the state if you are pregnant. And how might we know that? We might know that through your social media accounts, through your Google searches. Think about the level of surveillance and intrusion that we are about to experience. So I think that there will be a, a, a reaction as people see what this means in the real world. You'll have those who are trying to go after other rights and make, you know, maybe they're going to go after IVF, they'll go after IUDs, they'll go after contraception more generally. That is going to cause a reaction. And people are going to say, is this America where some faceless bureaucrat or some state legislator or some governor is deciding what's right for me and my family? Then I think you'll see the reaction. But how long that takes, I can't predict. And, and Steve, you, had, you, you wanted to jump I just want to add... One thing, Secretary Clinton's talked a lot about what the Secretary's contribution was at sort of the global or national level to advance the cause of women. I think it's important to sort of also talk about the micro level. Uh, Secretary Albright, Madeline, had what my Scottish grandmother would call spunk. <laughs> a and she really needed it because she decided she would ascend the ranks of a very challenging national security uh, field that was all men, all the time. Uh, I remember one of the things I would like to quote, uh, Madeline was introduced by Henry Kissinger at a dinner after she became secretary. And trying to be gracious, he said, Madeline, welcome to the fraternity. <laughs> Not surprisingly, Madeline turned to him and said, Henry, I hate to tell you this, but it's not a fraternity anymore. It was not easy for her. She made it to the top. As she said, it took her a long time to find her voice. And once she had it, she wasn't going to be silent. And she wasn't. But what she did was mentor and promote a whole generation of women who are literally in the process of transforming the national security field. Think about it. Today, we have a woman who is Deputy Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador to NATO, head of the, who is the Director of National Intelligence, and a woman Vice President. This is part of Secretary Clinton's legacy and something of which she can really be proud. And, and I want to I wanna ask you, as you talk about sort of the trailblazing women, um, one trailblazing woman, of course, was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She, of course, is celebrated by so many. But there is some pushback that, that has been happening about whether or not she should have retired in 2016 and that that may have saved abortion rights from being revoked. Do you think she should have retired in 2016 during the Obama administration? You know, I really am not going to second guess Ruth. I mean... Um talk about pioneers and, and people who literally changed the law. Um, I mean, I'm, I am old enough to uh, remember when I could not get a credit card in my own name. Um, I was practicing law. My husband was the attorney general of Arkansas. I made a lot more money than he did, and I could not get a credit card. 
I applied for one, and they told me I'd have to use my husband's credit card. I mean, people forget it was cases brought by Ruth starting in the 70s that began to chip away at the embedded um, it's sexism in so many of our institutions. So I, I, I don't want to second guess it, but, you know, it is, it's worth remembering that President Obama was denied the right to appoint the successor to Scalia, something unprecedented, inexcusable, that Mitch McConnell engineered. So who's to know what would have happened Suppose Ruth had decided. There's no guarantee that what we think might have happened would have happened. So um, I, I'd prefer uh, to, you know, really think about the many contributions uh, of uh, Ruth. And, you know, like Madeline, um, she just didn't think she had time for dying. I mean, Ruth and Madeline, <laughs> it, it was not on their schedule. And... <laughs> They didn't want to talk about it or worry about it or worry their family or their friends about it. So um, I, I think that's how we should uh, think about it, too. I'll, I'll also add that Ruth, um, in her spunk, that was very much like Secretary Albright, pushed back on this during her lifetime, saying, who would you prefer to be on the court than me? So I'll just answer that that's what she would have said if I had asked her that question as well, um, just to put that into context. Um, we also know that Secretary Albright, she was obviously in politics. She understood not only diplomacy, but domestic politics. Um, there has been some pushback from Democrats. Um, one last question on abortion, which is Democrats have gotten pushback by send, because they were sending fundraising emails telling people to donate um, after this ruling of overturning Roe v. Wade. What, how concerned are you that Democrats don't have an effective strategy to try to get abortion rights restored in this country? And what should that strategy entail? Well, you see, I don't understand the criticism because the strategy is elect more Democrats. And so in order to get any kind of plan that can begin to ameliorate the effects and eventually uh, hopefully reverse them in the states and to protect uh, the right such as it exists for other states to uh, be uh, offering, uh, you know, uh, abortion. It is about elections. I mean, people act as though we should do everything except talk about electing people who will stand up against this kind of regressive pushback, rolling the clock back on our civil rights, our human rights, gay rights, women's rights. And, and I would just add, anybody who doesn't take Clarence Thomas's uh, dissent seriously has not been paying attention to Clarence Thomas. He is signaling exactly what he intends to signal to judges at the lower level in the federal system, judges in state systems, legislators, attorneys general. Hey, start figuring out how to get some cases. It, it may not happen right away, might not even succeed the first or second time, but put your minds to work. Start trying it out. Because if we take away Roe because we think substantive due process doesn't exist, and, well, remember, we weren't in the Constitution. That is true. Um, we weren't in the 14th and 13th Amendment. That is true. But that's not our fault, and we shouldn't be blamed for the fact that we were left out of our Constitution until we finally fought our way into it. And a quick, and a quick follow before I go to the state of our democracy, which clearly is a whole situation. Um, uh, one quick last question on, on this, which is, what do you say to people who say, why should we trust Democrats to give them more power if they haven't used the time that they had to codify Roe v. Wade? Um, I've heard that from d Democrats who have voted for people, um, de loyal, loyal Democrats and supporters of yourself and others. What do you say to people who are sort of demoralized at this moment? Well, I wish Madeline were here because I can almost hear her saying, no whining on the yacht. <laughs> I mean, wringing of hands, whining, worrying. You know, we have a system that is very difficult by design to navigate. And we have a thing in the Senate called the filibuster. And yes, we have a 50-50 Senate. And the idea that we could codify Roe, given the filibuster, is just a pipe dream. Now, I personally believe 
that the Democrats should take a great big breath and risk lifting the filibuster for constitutional issues at the very least. I believe we should go ahead and get rid of it and just fight it out in the political arena. And where you have the votes, you have the votes. But at the very least, on the constitutional issues, and the two that come to mind are a woman's right to privacy, a woman's right to make the most intimate, difficult choices because of that, and uh, voting rights, we should lift the filibuster and make those uh, cases. And, and, and Steve, Secretary Albright was so um, dedicated to defending democracy in the United States and abroad. We saw the January 6th hearings that have been going on. What do you think she would make of this moment? What do you think her career um, tells us about how to handle this moment where we're watching in real time how close American democracy came to possibly bring bot to its knees when we think about how close um, former President Trump came to um, overturning the election. This isn't a question about Republicans as much as it's a question about the, the career of Secretary Albright and her, her eye toward defending democracy. Look, she was very uh, aware and engaged on the problems with our democracy at home. She was very aware of the challenge to our democracy abroad. She would underscore, I think, what President Biden has said. There is a struggle between democracy and authoritarianism out there. And the, quite frankly, the Democrats aren't doing very well. Because of our domestic problems, our brand, which was the you know, gold standard for democracy internationally, is not looking so good. And a lot of people are being taken in by this notion that the authoritarians can deliver, can deliver quickly without a, the division and discontent of the democracies. And I think a lot of Americans at home are not sure that isn't right. But Madeleine, very much the opposite, the optimist, had this to say about that, and I'd like to read a quote, and I think it applies both here at home and abroad. She wrote in her last essay, in Foreign Affairs, which was in the November-December 2021 issue, she wrote the following, and this is so Madeline. After too many years of hand-wringing, the time is right for democratic forces to regain the initiative. Democracy is fragile, but it is also resilient. In every region, the generation coming of age is smart, outspoken, and fearless. Worldwide, people are demanding more, while authoritarian leaders are tiring and running out of ideas. She thought that democracy was in position to have a rebirth, and I think both abroad and here at home. The only problem is that we needed her to lead the revival in both places. Uh, as you talk about Secretary Albright talking about this sort of rebirth of democracy, I'm also thinking about the fact that we got a warning from a conservative judge, Michael Ludig, who said that he believes that Republicans in 2024 will seek to overturn the election if a Republican nominee is not elected. Secretary Clinton, how concerned are you that in 2024 we could see a successful coup? And what do you think should be done to try to prevent that? Well, I think um, we now know there was an attempted coup on January 6th. Uh, thankfully, uh, it was not successful. Parts of it uh, were stymied and, uh, and or unsuccessful. Um, but make no mistake about it, that's what this was. You had uh, a sitting president absolutely determined to rest a second term however he could, despite the fact he lost both the popular vote and the Electoral College. Believe me, it's painful enough to win one and lose the other. Um, so, I, I, think, I think that gives you an indication of where at least the mindset is among a significant portion of the Republican Party nationally uh, and at the states. And here's why. Um, if you look at uh, the last election, you can see why Trump may have been 
uh, surprised at the outcome. So in my race, um, I won by, I don't know, uh, somewhere near two, three million, two and a half, three million, and then lost the Electoral College by about 77,000. Biden wins by more than seven million and wins the Electoral College by only 100,000. So the information that Trump and his campaign was getting during the day, and having been in that situation, I have a pretty good idea, from Georgia, from Arizona, from Pennsylvania, from Wisconsin, from Michigan, the states that were really in play for the Electoral College, is that it's going to be close, but we're going to pull it out. You know? And you know, there was reason to believe, given the closeness of it, that that might have happened, but it didn't. And so the margins within those states were so small. We're talking 10,000, 11,000, 14,000 votes. So the plan now, the best I can tell, is to make it even more difficult for people that the Republicans believe will not vote for them to vote. Um, you know, limiting uh, early voting, limiting weekend voting, limiting mail-in uh, balloting, which we did during COVID because people understandably didn't want to leave their homes. You know, just look at every technique they can to try to limit the electorate. But even more insidiously, install people who are going to be the vote counters with very specific direction about how to count those votes. And I'm Look, I'm hoping, I, you know, I was in the Senate for eight years. I, sir, I, I probably worked with every Republican there. I, I developed real friendships. I traveled. I don't recognize, you know, some of my former colleagues. Um, and I'm hoping that especially after yesterday, we will see among the Republican leadership what I saw as a young staff lawyer on the impeachment staff investigating Richard Nixon. Because when the evidence was gathered, and it was done in a totally nonpartisan, independent way, but when it was gathered and the vote was held in that Judiciary Committee all those years ago, Republicans voted to impeach Richard Nixon based on the evidence. And then Republican leaders like Barry Goldwater and others went to the White House and said to the president, it's time for you to go. And we need some leadership within the Republican Party. You know, we can still argue about every issue under the sun, but we've got to recognize the very real threat that January 6th and the continuing advocacy of the big lie poses to the legitimacy of our democracy and whatever may come next with fake alternative electors or whatever other uh, you know, strategies they try to deploy and I just want to end with this story. So, you know, when um, I accepted President Obama's um, invitation request to be Secretary of State, the first trip I took was to Asia, and I included Indonesia, which is where he had lived for some time as a young uh, boy, and there was so much excitement in Indonesia because of President Obama. And um, I agreed to be on a local but widely watched morning television show. Don't ask me why, but the people who traveled with me thought it was a good idea. <laughs> and the show translated was called The Awesome Show. <laughs> and there were a lot of singing and dancing and skits, and I was watching it before I went out. I thought, well, am I going to sing? Am I going to dance? What am I going to be doing? But in fact, it was an audience, you know, smaller than this, but still a lot of people who were going to ask me questions. And so I took a question. Here was the question. We watched the campaign between you and President Obama, and you both said very mean things about each other. <laughs> and it looked like you did not like each other. And then he asked you to be Secretary of State, and you said you would. How did that happen? <laughs> because they're a relatively young democracy. And I said, well, because we both love our country, and we both wanted to serve it. And you could see, you know, expressions on these young people's faces like, oh, that's how it's supposed to work. Peaceful transition, working together, solving problems, having principled disagreements. And that was, as Steve said, that was 
the message about democracy that as Secretary of State or as Madeleine's Secretary of State, we took all over the world. And that's what's being damaged. It's going to be really harder for us to make that case in so many places who are going to say, oh, I watched those hearings. I heard that story. And it's going to take real work uh, to rebuild that. And a quick follow-up before I go to Steve. You talked about the need for Republican leadership in this moment. Um, there are also a lot of voters, I will say Democratic voters that I've interviewed myself, who say there also needs to be more courage on the Democratic side because there are Republicans who are getting elected all over this country, election deniers, who are having a lot of success. Um, what do you think needs to be done on the Democratic side to really push back on Republicans and their inroads that they're making? Again, I mean, it, it's... it's Election by election, you know, we have national elections for sure, but they're often won at the state and local level. And candidates, Democrats, have to be willing to defend democracy, but also, let's not forget, talk about how they want to help deliver for the people that are going to uh, be voting. And so there is nothing quick or easy or soundbitey about making these cases and, you know, having, you know, run for the Senate and run for president. I mean, you go from different parts of the country and what you emphasize in one part may not be the same, even though there's a national you know, press corps following you. Uh, and so you've got to be attuned to what's on people's minds. And, and honestly, a lot of people are worried about inflation. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about you know, what's going to happen to their family, their small business, their farm. That's real world stuff. And you've got to have some way of addressing that. But it needs to be put into the context of, you know, we can do both. We can try to deliver and we can uh, protect and nurture our democracy. Yeah, as Secretary Albright said, people need to be able to vote and they need to be able to eat. Right. Um, with that, Steve, I, I'm, I know I'm coding Secretary Albright. I know that's, your, that's what you're going to do, so go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to just make one comment on this. And I am not qualified to speak on the politics in the morning meetings under the Bush administration, when I occasionally would venture a political opinion, my friend Carl Rove would say, Hadley, stick to foreign policy. That's something you know at least a little about. <laughs> but I would make one point. Uh, it is interesting that the hearings, the January 6th hearings, that we have seen, the case that is being made against the constitutional outrages that were being contemplated is being made by Republicans who served in the Trump administration, but who nonetheless put their oath of office and the Constitution ahead of that service. And, that's, and it's being led by, of course, two Republicans who Speaker Pelosi appointed to the committee, and one woman, of course, Liz Cheney, who's doing a fantastic job. So look, there is a fight going on within the Republican Party. I can't tell you how it's going to come out. Um, there, there are struggles going on in both parties. This is a, a, a real uh, inflection point for our democracy, and I can't tell you how it's going to come out. Um, that's, I mean, that's stark and poignant. Um, of course, Secretary Albright had a lot to say about Vladimir Putin. Um, she, um, I learned um, in doing this research, she was the, literally the first United States official to meet Putin um, as he became the leader of Russia. And she always said, do not forget who he is, that he's smart, that he's a KGB officer. Talk about, Secretary Clinton, how her understanding of him evolved, especially after the invasion of Ukraine. Well, I think she always knew what he was. And as you quote um, her, uh, she did meet him. She was Secretary of State when he was literally plucked from obscurity in St. Petersburg and brought to Moscow uh, to be... Um, in, I guess in Yeltsin's terms, kind of groomed to be his successor. Um, and so Madeline had a chance to meet him, and, and she has described, and she's written about this, that it was kind of chilling um, because uh, he's a very cold, calculating uh, presence. And I, I think um, I had my own experiences with him, and he apparently didn't uh, agree with me. Um, and uh, That was really, really eloquent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do have a lot of Putin stories, but I, w I will tell you that um, 
the thing that he was most angry with me about um, was when I said I was Secretary of State, they'd held uh, Russian Duma elections, and they were so blatantly uh, fraudulent. I mean, there was video of people stuffing ballots into boxes and throwing away boxes that had ballots they didn't want to count. It was it, what we think of as dictatorship elections. And so I said, look, the you know, people of Russia deserve free and fair elections, deserve to have their voices heard and their votes counted. And there were riots or protests, not riots, but there were demonstrations, huge demonstrations in Moscow and St. Petersburg, a few other places. And so Putin blamed me for organizing the demonstrations, which, you know, I mean, I had nothing to do with, um, but he couldn't believe his own people would not be docile in the face of his abuses because he had already been uh, quite uh, clear in what his intentions were. Uh, so he fears democracy. He fears Democrats, small d Democrat. Uh, he fears uh, freedom. Uh, he is a control freak of the you know, first degree. Uh, and when he invaded first Georgia in 2008, when Steve was there, and then invaded uh, Crimea when Obama was there, um, I think we had a failure of imagination, if I could just you know, characterize it that way. It was hard to believe that in the 21st century, we would have Russia start another war in Europe. And I think people tried to you know, minimize Georgia. People said, well, you know, Saakashvili, he's so difficult, uh, whatever, he provoked it. So, you know, Putin took two uh, states in Georgia, one of them on the Black Sea, then he takes Crimea, and it was like, well, you know, the Ukrainians, they're kind of corrupt and they're difficult. And, well, you know, that, that should satisfy Putin. And I think we forgot the lessons of history, and Madeleine never forgot them. I mean, Madeleine never, ever gave Putin a pass that somehow he would take just a little bit more of Europe in his, you know, uh, near abroad, his, his neighbors, and be satisfied. And... She really agreed with those leaders, particularly in the Baltics, who were the most outspoken when I was Secretary of State, and Madeleine knew a lot of them, about how you can't trust Putin. He's really going after democracy. He's trying to suborn our politicians. He's having the oligarchs buy the media. But I think it was hard. It was hard, not just the U.S., but it was certainly hard for Europe to think, wait a minute, you know, this can't be happening. And here's what I also believe. I think... You know, Putin had the biggest gift with Trump because I do believe, you know, John Bolton and others have said this, that given a second term, Trump would have taken us out of NATO. He took us out of the Paris Accords, took us out of the Iran Agreement, and whatever you think about either one, it was abrupt and nothing was put in the place. I mean, you know, you could argue, okay, take us out of the Iran Agreement but have something else to put in place so we know what the Iranians are doing. So people thought that he would take us out of NATO. Once he did not get a second term, I think that accelerated Putin's timetable. And quickly, because I want to ask you a last question about Madeleine Albright. Do you think the approach has been right this time around from the Biden administration? Are they doing enough with Russia? Really quickly. I do think, I, I give the Biden administration high marks for the way they've handled Ukraine. I, and look, today, Madeleine is smiling on us because Finland and Sweden are joining NATO. She was a big believer in NATO. And... And, and why are they? They would have stayed neutral. They would have stayed out of NATO. But all of a sudden, they're now seeing Putin through the you know, very clear eyes that we all have of him. And Ukraine is, is criticizing that because they're saying that their application is being ignored. Look, I, I think that we, we've got to help Ukraine stabilize the situation, give them as much military hardware, as much training, as much humanitarian aid as we possibly can. I hope they are going to gain membership in the European Union. And eventually, I think they've earned uh, their right in NATO, but we're not going to be having that process in the middle of a war. First, we've got to try to, you know, stymie Putin's advance and, you know, hold him to his little ground as possible. And last two questions with, will you vote for both of you? You have about 30 seconds each. I'm just going to say that. Sorry, Secretary Clinton and Steve. But for you, Secretary Clinton, Katie talked about this. Um, Katie Albright, that is, talked about this. She recalled fighting a King James Bible with a scripture um, that was written by her mother. It was from Micah 6, 8 that says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love, mercy, and to walk humbly with our, with our God? 
How does that scripture connect to her life? I th- I, when I heard about that, I, I was so touched because it's one of my favorite scriptures, and it's, it's a good reminder for a life well lived. And I think she certainly exemplified uh, a life well lived in every way. And Steve, um, she trained uh, and, and mentored a bunch of women, a lot of women. How do you see the next generation of Madeleine Albright not filling her shoes, but definitely carrying on her legacy? I'd like to close with a quote from Madeleine. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a speech she, marked, she gave marking the 50th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. And she said the following, and I think this is her direction to those people who stand in her shoes. There is no certain roadmap to success, either for individuals or for generations. Ultimately, it is a matter of judgment, a question of choice. In making that choice, let us remember that there is not a page of American history of which we are proud that was authored by chronic complainer or a prophet of despair. We are doers. We have a responsibility, as others have in their time, not to be prisoners of history, but to shape history, a responsibility to fill the role of pathfinder and to build with others a global network of purpose and law that will protect our citizens, defend our interests, preserve our values, and bequeath future generations a legacy as proud as the one we honor today. Interestingly, her Secret Service code name was Pathfinder. (laughs) And that's who she was, Pathfinder and Pathmaker. And that's her charge to all of us and and those who follow her, be Pathmakers. And the generous people at Aspen have given us another minute, so I'm going to ask this last question because they give us a minute, which is, and it, and it connects straight to what you said about a pathfinder. Secretary Clinton, you said Harriet Tubman is one of your heroines, right. a pathfinder, of right. course, someone who found her way to freedom over and over again and took other people with her. How do you connect Secretary Albright, who was a defender of freedom, who talked about freedom, to the legacy of Harriet Tubman and these phenomenal women together? What a great question. That is so wonderful. You know, um, I, I am a, a huge admirer of Harriet Tubman, and um, you know, she wasn't just someone who rescued slaves. Uh, she was a scout for the Union Army. Uh, she was deeply involved in helping uh, the Union Army liberate uh, slaves in the South. And um, so she was someone who was on, literally on the front lines of history her entire life. And that's who Madeline was. Madeline was on the front lines of history from the time she was a little girl um, and seeing the Blitz in London and then fleeing her home country and coming to this country she loved and admired and served. And she kept trying to remind us as someone who wasn't born here, who was a refugee, um, how blessed we are. But we can't take any of that for granted. We have to keep working as, as the quote that... Steve Red so eloquently suggests. Um, so, you know, there are these women in American history uh, that I do see as pathfinders, as change makers. They, they are always trying to bring others along with them. You know, you can be famous and you can accomplish things, but it's not the same as also remembering where you came from and making sure others get the same opportunities that you did people who keep that ladder steady for those who come behind. And uh, in the recent uh, magazine from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, (coughs) there were wonderful articles by students. And this is not just in America. Students all over the world look to her uh, as somebody who was a pathfinder. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Clinton, Steve Hadley, and thank you all for joining us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.